good afternoon. <laughs> Once again, please look at this extreme, extremely remarkable image. It's called the Hubble D Deep, what's it called? Hubble Extreme Deep Field. And it's an image taken from Earth of a part of the night sky. And what makes this, <clears throat> this image was taken of a portion of the sky that's chosen to be unremarkable. In this image, there are no bright stars, there are no planets, there are no moons. It's not part of the central part of the Milky Way galaxy. As a matter of fact, to the naked eye, it's merely a dark patch of the sky. And it's also a very tiny patch that represents 1 28 millionth of the night sky. But what does make it remarkable, in this image, there are over 10,000 galaxies visible. And extrapolating, that means there are over 3 trillion galaxies visible from Earth. And since each galaxy is made up of between 200 billion and 1 trillion stars each, we are immediately led to an absolutely profound conclusion, the staggering immensity of space. When considering the size of space, we're presented with a series of barriers, a barrier of distance, a barrier of time, and a barrier of comprehension. Most of these galaxies are so far away that given our understanding of the current laws of physics, we'll never be able to visit them or communicate with them. So the question I have is, are we alone? Are there other intelligent life forms in the universe? Given the size of the galaxies and the size of the space, how could we not be alone? How could we possibly be alone? There has to be many, many out there. So I guess the real question is, should we try to search out and communicate with these species? So my question is, how many galaxies, how many civilizations are there in our galaxy that are capable of interstellar communication that are actually trying to do so? This question was first posed by Professor Frank Drake, an astrophysicist at Cornell University in the early 1960s. The now famous Drake equation allows us to come up with a number, actually a numerical value for that question. The laws of physics and the size of the universe conspire against us, however. Um, Professor Einstein told us the greatest rate at which we can communicate is at the speed of light. And since our galaxy is about 100,000 light years in diameter, a phone call from one side to the other side and back again would require patience. <laughs> it would go something like this. Hello, anybody there? And you wait for 100,000 years for the signal to go out another 100,000 years for the signal to come back, you're putting me on hold? <laughs> the nearest galaxy outside of our own is the Andromeda galaxy. It's 2.5 million light years away. So given the size of that, it tells us if we're going to look, we should look locally. And by locally, I mean within our galaxy and probably near our solar system. So if this is the Drake equation. It consists of a series of factors, all of which are estimatable, some with certainty and some are a little speculative, that allows us to come up with that particular number. I would like to go through these factors one at a time and realizing if any of those factors turn out to be zero, the game is over. The first factor is N sub S. N sub S represents the number of stars in our galaxy. This number is quite well known. There are about 400 billion stars in our galaxy. Our galaxy is an ordinary spiral galaxy. There's some more spectacular galaxies out there. There's the Sombrero Galaxy. It has about one trillion stars and has a supermassive black hole at the center. And there are also the, the starburst galaxies. They're breeding grounds for new stars. Ours is an average spiral galaxy. It has only about 400 billion stars. Of those stars, what fraction are suitable for planetary systems? That's the next factor. Not all stars are alike. Some stars are very dim. Some stars are very hot and burn out very, very quickly. Some stars are actually binary stars. They orbit about each other. But this, how many, what fraction are actually suitable for planetary systems is also well known. By sky surveys, by, ast by astrophysicists, we know that value to be about one half. So of the 400 billion stars, about 200 billion are suitable for planetary systems. Of the ones that are suitable for planetary systems, how many of them actually have planets? The current party line in physics is that star systems form at the same time as planet systems. The mechanism that forms stars is the same as the mechanism that form planets. The Kepler telescope was launched in 2009, was tasked with finding exoplanets, 
planets outside of our solar system. It's currently found over 4,000. How many, what percentage of planets that are, in the, that, are, that are suitable for planetary systems actually have planets? We think it would be all of them. This factor evaluates to about one. Just because a planet exists doesn't mean it can su is suitable for life. What we have to do is we have to estimate the average number of locations that are Earth-like, that are within the continuously habitable zone, or called the Goldilocks zone, where it can't be too hot or too cold, it's just right. Places like Mercury are way too hot. Magnesium and sodium are gases on Mercury. Places like Pluto are way too cold. Nitrogen is a solid on Pluto. So our big gas giants, the Neptune and Saturn and Jupiter, are, won't work either because they have no solid surface on which liquid can pool. Um, the liquids have been found on many places in the solar system, on Earth, on Venus, on Mars, and on several of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. So we have to estimate what's the average number of locations around the solar system where we could expect life. Estimates are, estimates are between five and 15. I'm gonna go conservative with just five. Now the next set of values are a little bit more speculative. And for non-scientists, they can be controversial and maybe disturbing. So for a planet that's in the Goldilocks zone, what's the likelihood that life will actually show up? Right. <clears throat> oh, there's not consensus among human beings, among scientists, about how life actually started. It could have started in thermal pools next to hot bud springs. It could have started on the shores of an ancient ocean. It could have started in clay particles buried in the soil. Um, the building blocks, there are many experiments where the building blocks of life, amino acids, sugars, and long polymers have been known to form spontaneously. So given enough time, tens of millions of years, these, these compounds could sit in solution and increase in concentration, and by random mixing could form new longer compounds, and eventually perhaps RNA-like molecules that could self-replicate, the pre prerequisite for life. This is where we have to be a little optimistic perhaps, but Given enough time, there's nothing that would prevent these from happening. And we would expect this value, as most exobiologists say, to be one. The theory of evolution by natural selection is a fundamental principle and guiding principle of biology. And it also applies to all the life on Earth and probably would apply to alien life. Now, since intelligence has survival value, probably intelligence would be selected for. The next term measures what fraction of those life forms actually develop some form of intelligence. Well, survival, since intelligence has survival value, we would expect that at least they would, that would actually occur. We expect this value to be one. Evolution probably wins. Now, what's the chance that some of those civilizations or some of those life forms that are intelligent would actually go on to develop tools or technology so they could communicate? Humans did. Um, there are other large species on Earth that have large uh, bringing to body ratios, dolphins, chimpanzees, Neanderthals. Dolphins have a problem because they don't have thumbs. <clears throat> but this message, how much a fraction of them would actually start to using tool use. There are a lot of species on Earth that are known to use tools. Right? And certainly tool use is a precursor to technology development. But certainly it's a long way from a bird sticking a stick into a hole and pulling out an insect to a human being operating a radio. I think in this case, we probably have to be conservative. What fraction of those intelligent species that show up that actually develop communication skills? I'm gonna call this one in a thousand. The next thing is, could a civilization come into existence that knows how to use technology, but not use it? Are they willing to use the technology to communicate? Well, we have evidence on Earth that's true. The Amish, for example, have agreed as a group to not use any technology beyond what was available in the 1800s. And it turns out we, as a species, have been inadvertently communicating and broadcasting our presence for over 80 years. The first strong radio broadcast started out in the 1920s, and they were broadcast from one continent to another continent. But those broadcasts were cast broadly, and they've been flying out there for 80 years. That means for any intelligent civilization out there that's less than 80 light years away and is listening, they already know we're here. 
So this is another factor we have to estimate. What fraction of those species will actually try to communicate? I'm going to be conservative again and call this one in a thousand. Now we can take all these factors together and put them together and calculate the number of civilizations out there that are capable of interstellar communication that are actually trying to do so. That number, I believe, is about one million. So the question is, where are they? Where are they? A number of astronomers and observatories around the world have been searching out and looking for the radio signals from outside. And the results have been almost universally negative. Except in 1977, in a project in association with Ohio State University, a signal was detected, famously now called the wow signal because of the notation on the paper chart recording its existence. It had all the characteristics expected of an extraterrestrial communication. It was the right direction. It didn't seem to come from Earth. It was the right length, and it was the right duration. That seemed to come from a part of the sky known as where the Sagittarius, Sagittarius constellation is, where the stars there are between 120 and 1,200 light years away. But the signal was not detected by any sta other station on Earth. It only lasted 72 seconds, and it was never heard again. For civilizations to hear each other or be heard, they have to overlap in time. And here's where it gets a little depressing, perhaps. Maybe it's a case that as soon as a civilization develops the radio technology, they also develop the ability to destroy themselves. Human beings invented radios in the powerful radios in the 1920s. By the 1940s, we had invented nuclear weapons that we could use to obliterate ourselves. Maybe by developing technology, a society will pollute the planet so horribly they'll poison themselves. So, are we alone? I don't think so. I'm sure there are many other life forms out there. And I think we can get beyond this barrier of our technological infancy and go on and exist for many, many, many years. I'm very much an optimist. And I think that right now, I think there's at least one million civilizations out there. But even if it's only one in a million, I think we should still look. Thank you. Mm -hmm.